hackerspace are particularly interesting and important, I think, because they're um, a form of social organization around technology uh, where a uh, human comes first. Uh, and I, I think the, the questions we are to ask ourselves are very much related to uh, the core of what we consider uh, technology, what we consider uh, as our, our relation to technology, and uh, in the end, the, the way we, we define our humanities. Uh, we live in um, very interesting times um, where we are just, just opening our, our eyes after a very long sleep. Uh, this uh, alarm that woke, up, woke us up uh, is indeed the, the revelations of this courageous young man called Edward Snowden. Among the most important things that we learn from these revelations beyond the, uh, the, 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 the state paranoia of these uh, mechanisms um, is the, the key question of our relationship to, to technology and to st those technological companies. The, the fact is that we now see the, the clear picture of the most gigantic machine ever built by man that is completely dedicated to spy on us. Um, Google, Facebook, Apple, Microsoft, and many others are all together forced by US law to give away to NSA and its public partners all of our data. Um, those devices we have in our pockets that some people still call smart phones um, are not phones and are not smart. Yes. They're not telephones because they're computers. They're computers with the most advanced, the, 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 the highest number of sensors we've ever seen. Uh, sensors of sound, microphones, sensors of image, cameras, sensors of movement, sensors of proximity, sensors of geographical location, sensors of pressure, sensors of acceleration, and so on, and so on, and so on. Um, they are not smart because they contain those chips that are black boxes, the, the modem chips, the, the so-called baseband chips, that are the chips through which all communications happen, through which all voice, all messages, all data go through, and we cannot know how they function, therefore we cannot control them. What happened is that in about 20 years, we went from the era of the friendly machines to the era of those enemy machines. Uh, you may remember those 8-bit and 16-bit computers, the Commodore, Amstrad, Atari, Amiga, and the such. Uh, you, you could open them very simply with a screwdriver, look at everything that was inside, and understand everything that was inside. Those machines were made for us to understand them, to, to learn from them, and to control them, to, to push their limits. So th this, this control of knowledge, this control of usage, of the machines, we now see is entirely used by the US government and its public and private partners. But let's ask ourselves for a second what this control means. Surveillance on people uh, has a radical impact on the way they behave. When we're, we know we are under surveillance, our behavior change. We know that, uh, well, if you, if you know that your boss will read all of your communications, you won't use your communication to say, my boss is an idiot, which means self-censorship, uh, which means that uh, attacking privacy is an indirect attack, potentially on freedom of speech. If, if you know you're surveilled and your government is slightly authoritarian, maybe you won't go to a meeting about the creation of a new political party. So attacking our privacy 
means attacking many other fundamental freedoms like freedom of speech, freedom of movement, freedom of reunion, of gathering. Um, but most importantly, it attacks us in our very intimacies, in the space where we are um, in full trust, either alone with ourselves and or with others. Um, intimacy is the place where you're not judged by your peers, is the place where you can experiment with new ideas. Uh, this is where you can uh, uh, create, this is where you can invent. Uh, we can argue that we're the, the, some of the, the harshest moment in history, the most violent, the most authoritarian. Uh, what is at the core of, it, of our intimacies is uh, really our, our identities, the very definition of who we are as human beings. And so this is what is at risk today. Our intimacies, our identities are now indissociables. C'est dit, c'est de, de, de la technologie. And they might be already in the hand of a few companies and mainly one government and its partners. We must think of what would be the consequences for our societies. And we must invent a way to, to reconquer our humanities through technology. <clears throat> the consequences on our society are easy to imagine. We have examples in our more or less recent histories of authoritarian regime who used surveillance as a mean of social control. If you're a journalist, a politician, a lawyer, a doctor, if you're the, the CEO of an innovative company, somebody with access to your communication can sink you like this. In, in all those cases, access to this global network of surveillance means a tremendous imbalance of power that in turn can lead to tremendous injustice. And when we look at it from the eyes of a, of a hacker, we, we tend to see that, that it is some characteristics of technology that enable this massive network of surveillance. We know those characteristics. A, I described it earlier, it is the, the closed systems, the closed software, the closed chips, the closed hardware, where withholding of knowledge from the user is used to control him or her. Um, B, it's the massive centralization of services and data. Uh, Google not only knows what you search, but who you talk to, but, and what you tell them, uh, where you want to go, where you go what you want to buy, what you buy, what you want to watch, and what you watch, what pages on the net you see, and how long you stay on them. By aggregating all those information, and much more, Google obtains tremendous power. And we know in history that concentration of power never turns well. The, the third characteristic, C, um, is an illusion of security. Train people to look for a little padlock in their web browser <laughs> rather than asking themselves how to secure their communication. Um, train people to trust third parties and uh, companies for their security. When you trust the padlock in your browser, you actually trust the company who trusts the company who trusts the company who trusts the company in the certificate architecture. And we know that this architecture of certificates is broken and that NSA has access everywhere. Um, we hackers, uh, enthusiasts, curious people, now have um, a global responsibility of tremendous importance. Um, because in front of those patterns for surveillance and control, uh, are the patterns for uh, freedom and autonomy. As, as a mirror 
uh, to the characteristics I just described. A, free, libre software that belongs to humanity as a whole, uh, on which the author makes the choice to uh, give them to the world, to give to the world the same freedom he has the on his or her software. Of course, is the question of the free hardware, and we have a major problem here. We, we don't have a solution for uh, a free software baseband, the modem chip, that we would control ourselves. And only the Chinese today know how to build them. Uh, B, the decentralization of services, to get to know where our data and our communications are, to put our trust in uh, a hackerspace, an association, a company, uh, a bunch of friends, rather than Google and Facebook. And, uh, of course, C is end-to-end -end encryption. La encripción de punto a punto. Because users take care of their keys by themselves, I instead of trusting those US companies owned by the NSA. If you manage your key and I manage my key, when we communicate together, nobody else, in theory, can get in the way. This is the only way today to guarantee the, the security of our communications. We, we know that people usually think, oh, those things are too complicated, I don't understand them because I'm not an engineer. So what we see is that on one hand we have these technologies that are perceived as too complicated because I'm not an engineer and I don't understand nothing. And on the other hand, <laughs> technology that are user-friendly. What we, we see is that the, the technology that is user-friendly is actually a user enemy. It's a technology where, where companies withdraw choice from us to control us. The, the, the same way we, we got this uh, semantic trick on making us believe that this technology was easy, I think we have a, a role to play to, to break this technophobia uh, about technology that liberates. Because what this technology have in common, Libre software, decentralized services and end-to-end -end encryption is that f f to use them, you have to appropriate them. You have to, to learn them, you have to appropriate them, you have to uh, uh, anthropo anthropophagia, you have to integrate them into yourself. Uh, it, it is at this price and at this only price that we can become more free through technology. So we are in a, in a situation, to take, analogy, to take an analogy, where we have maybe 95% of population who doesn't know how to read. Because accepting a contract of Google, Apple, or Facebook without un understanding the underlying communication architecture is like signing a contract without knowing how to read. And we wouldn't imagine that people would tell us, oh, I don't want to learn how to read, come on, it's so complicated, and I have no time. We would consider those people unanimously as idiots, or we would try to convince them. So I think we are in a similar moment in time. Um, and that the, the technologies that are used um, against us lead to similar exploitation of the people and potentially the countries. Uh, that you can do with making people sign contracts without knowing how to read. Uh, but we are here in one of the 1,000, what, 1,600 hackerspaces in the world. Uh, it is one of the ways we invented recently for sharing knowledge in a decentralized way. We invented free software, we invented Wikipedia, we invented OpenStreetMap and BitTorrent. We demonstrated already that with those decentralized modes of organization, we could defeat some of the most powerful political powers in the world. We defeated ACTA, that the was pushed by 39 countries, Hollywood and Big Pharma. We, we defeated SOPA and PIPA, that were pushed in the US by Hollywood. We obtained the Marco Civil do Internet in Brazil, and two days ago, one in first reading only, a protection of net neutrality in Europe. Uh, and I count on you to win on net neutrality here in Mexico. So, 
we, we see the world as it is, we see the, the, the challenges we, we have to face, and so much needs to be invented. Things must be invented on the technological level, things must be changed on the, the political level, but I think the most important is what we can and what we will change Lo on a social and on a cultural level. And this is what we are doing here, all together. So I spoke enough.